The call came into emergency dispatch in the early morning hours of the 16th of April, 2012. A family home in Farmington Hills, Michigan had been broken into. Two intruders wielding baseball bats were in the house. They wanted money, but first, they needed to ensure that they could take what they wanted and escape apprehension. There could be no witnesses left alive in the house. From inside the closet in the bedroom, the call reached dispatch. It's my brother, the caller said. Send help. He's brought a friend. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. At JTL, we deliver serious coverage of the cases that really make you think. If that sounds like your type of true crime, then you've found the right place. It's possible that many of you will have heard something about the case that we're about to look at. But it's also likely that many of the details of this confusing and horrific crime have been glazed over. In this case, we had commentators blaming the entitled teenagers, others placing the blame on drugs, and the accused killers blaming each other. Let's take a look. Robert and Rosemary Cipriano adopted their eldest child, a boy they named Tucker, in 1993, when he was only four days old. Tucker was soon joined by twins, Salvatore and Tanner, and nearly 10 years later, the youngest, little Isabella. The family home is in Farmington Hills, which is a northwestern suburb of Detroit in Oakland County, Michigan. It is considered one of the best places to live in the state. It's a safe area and one perfect for raising a family. In the spring of 2012, Robert Cipriano worked for Dearborn Public Schools as an administrator. Rose had worked for years at the YMCA in Farmington Hills, where their youngest, eight-year-old Isabella, took swimming lessons. Sal and Tanner were both juniors at Detroit Catholic Central School. Tucker Cipriano, however, had become estranged to his parents, after a string of absences in his senior year of high school, Tucker had stopped attending entirely. He was arrested for a drug charge and staying with various friends. In early April, Tucker missed a required appointment with his probation officer. His absence was either not reported or his arrest not sought. But in either case, later that month, Tucker was free, couch surfing with various friends, and getting into trouble. In the early morning hours of April 16th, Tucker and a friend, Mitchell Young, parked Mitchell's truck outside of the Cipriano's family home. For what would be the third time that night, Tucker climbed into the house through a garage window. Then he walked through the home and opened the door to let his friend inside. In the garage, they found a baseball bat, and they would shortly acquire a second one. The two teenagers made their way inside the house through the kitchen. Exactly what took place next is a bit unclear, but some details are not in dispute. Robert Cipriano, likely awoken by noises from the family dog barking at the intruders, came into the kitchen. He either spotted Mitchell Young crouched in a corner by the front door and yelled for the teenager to get out of his house, or he was immediately attacked by his eldest son. A struggle followed that would end with Robert motionless on the kitchen floor. More family members had since awoken to the chaos. From another room, 17-year-old Tanner was placing a call to 911 dispatch. It was 2.47 a.m. Tanner reported that he was hiding in his bedroom closet while Tucker and his friend were somewhere else in the house, armed with baseball bats. Tanner was able to communicate the address of the house to the operator, as well as his concern that the attackers, his brother and another person, were somewhere nearby. Tanner's instinct to stay hidden was the right one, 
the attackers were, in fact, still inside the house. As police arrived at the property, Tucker fled out the back door, while Mitchell rushed up the stairs. He was spotted by the first responders as they entered the house. They arrested Mitchell immediately. We're very grateful that the 17-year-old did the right thing by hiding and dialing 911. He certainly may have saved him or his sister. And also the brave little eight-year-old girl who, when officers responded on what they thought was a family trouble run, went to the front door and heard noise and got her attention. And she was able to uh, run to the front door and open the door just in time for the officers actually to see one of the suspects going up the stairs who was taken into custody. Responders found Tucker's mother, Rose, sitting on the staircase, and his brother, Salvatore, laying on the ground under two aluminum baseball bats. Both had sustained severe, life-threatening head trauma. Neither one of them was responsive. Tucker's father, Robert, lay dead in the kitchen. A BB gun was next to Robert on the floor, but just like his son and wife, he had been attacked with a baseball bat. Tanner and Isabella remained unharmed. When Salvatore arrived at hospital, he was barely alive and the doctors initially did not expect a recovery. Rose was also in critical condition. Mitchell Young was also brought to the hospital where doctors found that he had a dislocated jaw. The teen suffered additional injuries to his face as well as his abdomen. All of these injuries appeared to have been caused by a baseball bat. How he had sustained them was not clear, but according to Mitchell, he had been a victim as well of Tucker Cipriano's. While the aftermath of the incident played out at hospital, law enforcement was also busy tracking down Tucker. And it didn't take too long. By 6 a.m., Farmington Hills Police had tracked Tucker Cipriano's cell phone to a home about 20 minutes north in Kigo Harbor. His cell phone had been left in his truck, which was spotted outside of the house when law enforcement arrived in force to apprehend the teenager. Inside, they found Tucker, who along with the two younger teens that lived there, was another good friend named Ian Zinderman. Ian would come to play a key role in piecing together what had happened in the lead up to the brutal attack on the Cipriano family. But a key part of understanding this, Ian said, was a drug, a legal substance widely available at the time across the state. It was called K2, or SPICE, a form of synthetic marijuana. He was really, really um, drugged up. He was on the synthetic drug, also known as SPICE, or um, K2, of strand of K2. And um, it's put in marijuana. It's it's what it is. It's its own synthetic. Um, it's like marijuana, but it's not marijuana. It's usually made from a different plant, and they drench it in different chemicals, and and they should really illegalize all that. A lot of kids came to me the same day and said he was on that spice. That spice, and the government needs to get it off the streets. Spice became widely available in the U.S. around 2008 and was not made illegal across the country until years later. The side effects from using the drug are potentially severe, including panic attacks and exaggerated fear, paranoia, hallucinations, tremors, or seizures. Ian told police that Tucker and Mitchell were both under the influence of and motivated by the drug. They sought money to purchase more spice, as well as a car and some cash to flee Tucker's existing charges. They needed to make it to Mexico. Tucker Cipriano and Mitchell Young, who often went by Roderick, had known each other for only a few weeks before the murder. Mitchell had been kicked out of his house roughly a month before the attack, while Tucker, likewise, was homeless and crashing with friends or at local motels. He got kicked out of his home because he couldn't pay for college and his mom wanted him to go to college. And that's when all of his struggles started to, you know, started to start. A couple weeks ago, he would show up a little bit late to work or he wouldn't look well kept. He was tired. He was living out of hotels or in his truck and he just wasn't performing his duties as well at work. He wasn't 
on top of things. He was like lost. Tucker could not make the claims of a rough upbringing that Mitchell could. Adopted as a baby, he had reportedly always struggled to fit in, but was given consistent support by his family. He was in therapy from a young age. Since he entered second grade, his mother drove him weekly to Ann Arbor to receive treatment for his ADHD and learning disability. When, in his teens, he became involved with drugs and alcohol, Rose attended substance abuse classes to learn about her son's condition. Tucker had stopped attending classes in his senior year of high school following an arrest for drug charges. His parents were often unable to track him down. But in the weeks before the attack, they had sent him messages on Facebook wishing him a happy birthday and hoping he would come home to celebrate. But these messages appear to have gone unaddressed. Both he and Mitchell were busy accumulating a laundry list of minor offenses. DUIs, retail fraud, breaking and entering. There were signs that the teenagers were spiraling further out of control. According to friends, Tucker was apparently devastated that his birth mother had recently died. His estrangement from his parents meant that he was no longer attending his regular counseling sessions, and he was showing signs of anger. One friend recounted that Tucker used to speak about killing people. He would make statements frequently about wanting to commit murder. He spoke about killing so brazenly and so often that friends could only assume that he must be joking. That is, until the night of April 16th, when his best friend, Ian Zinderman, was approached by Tucker and Mitchell with plans they had to break into the Cipriano home, kill the family, and steal what they thought would be several thousand dollars. Later, Ian recalled what he had been thinking. If they want to fuck up their life, they can do it. Don't bring me into it. He asked to be dropped at a friend's house and left Tucker and Mitchell to their plans. So I wish I actually believed him and uh, stopped him from doing it. Several hours after his arrest, Tucker Cipriano began telling police his version of events. And so too did Mitchell Young. Both changed their stories more than once before they landed on a chosen narrative. And also not surprisingly, each pointed to the other as the mastermind behind the attack and murder. After initially denying everything, Mitchell eventually told Sergeant Wabey of the Farmington Hills Police Department that Tucker's father, Robert, confronted them in the kitchen, and it was Tucker who attacked his father. When Mitchell yelled, what the fuck are you doing? Tucker struck Mitchell with the bat and threatened, if you don't get with the program, you're going to join him. Tucker then handed him the bat and told him to shut up his mother, who had entered the kitchen. Mitchell admitted that he then struck Rose. A fight ensued between Tucker and his brother Salvatore, who had retrieved his BB gun and had attempted to intervene. When headlights appeared outside, Tucker ran towards the back of the house and Mitchell ran up the stairs. Sergeant Wavy, who recorded Mitchell's statements, described the teenager's chameleon-like demeanor, which changed depending upon the circumstances. Upon leaving the district court, Mitchell went from nearly crying to smiling and asking the accompanying officer, off the record, how do you think I'm doing? Mitchell was not the only one with a story. In Tucker's version of events, it was Mitchell who attacked both his father and mother. Tucker described holding his father from behind as Mitchell hit him with a baseball bat. Rose Cipriano was attacked by Mitchell after she came downstairs, Tucker told police. Tucker left the kitchen briefly to hide his little sister away in her bedroom so that she wouldn't be hurt. He claimed that he knew that Tanner was hiding in an upstairs bedroom, but that he pretended to be unaware of his brother's location for his own protection. When confronted by Salvatore and the BB gun, he did hit Sal with the baseball bat. Then he said, 
he went to the bathroom and vomited. The Oakland County prosecutors had obtained two confessions from their two alleged killers. However, neither of their stories aligned to the other. Both confessions had been offered within hours of the attack. Both suspects immediately reneged on their statements and had sought to have them suppressed. Statement, I don't want to talk. What did you mean? Um, that I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to talk about what that meant. Tucker claimed that he had been high on drugs when he waived his Miranda rights and gave his statement. Similarly, Mitchell claimed his confession was involuntary. He had been up all night, hospitalized for his injuries, and handcuffed to the bed while questioned for hours. He had suffered a dislocated jaw and was uh, in the emergency room. He was taken from the, the scene where the police uh, took him into custody, and he went to Botsford Hospital, the same as two of the victims. Attempts to have both confessions omitted from the upcoming trial failed, but the defense teams were not finished exploring the connection between the attack and the dangerous yet legal drug taken by the teens. Tucker underwent a series of psychological evaluations. The theory being explored was whether the use of spice could cause a psychotic episode. A wealth of information that he was abusing and using K2 and he had used that for quite some time, even a number of years. And there's some experts that uh, may come forward to indicate that long-term use of K2 could result in psychosis, and at the time of this incident, he could have been psychotic. This defense was eventually abandoned. Drugs may have been the reason they were in the house that night, but it was not a viable defense for their crimes. While the teenagers attended pretrial hearings, Rose, after awaking from a two-week coma, had made progress towards a recovery from her head injuries and was released from hospital. Sal, miraculously, had also survived, but he would continue to receive intensive treatment at the hospital for many months. As the trial date approached, Rose Cipriano made a request of the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. She asked that they offer a plea deal to Tucker and Mitchell, a move that would provide an appropriate prison term but save her family the further pain and anguish that would be caused by reliving the events through a murder trial. She wrote in a letter to prosecutor Jessica Cooper that she wanted her son and his friend to get a sentence of 40 or 50 years that would take them into old age, but would not be a life without parole sentence. My personal opinion, I think it's a waste of taxpayers' money. I believe it's gonna traumatize the family. And if we enter into an agreement, for all intents and purposes, this young man's going to do the majority of his life in prison anyway. The community will be protected. If a trial was unavoidable, Rose asked that she and her children not be called as witnesses to testify. Robert's brother Greg Cipriano, himself an attorney, had relocated from New Jersey after his brother's murder to support the family. He believed that the prosecutor's office was behaving selfishly by pushing forward with a high-profile case instead of taking into account the best interests of the victims. Our only option is to appeal to the public uh, through the media, which is the last thing we wanted to do. The last thing that we wanted was to have exposure to the family. But the prosecutor's office has left us no choice but to appeal to the public and, and beg and plead for prosecutor Cooper to uh, help us. She's self-serving. She wants a big trial. They're basically being assaulted a second time. And this time, it's being done by Jessica Cooper. As jury selection for Tucker's trial was underway, and the witness list continued to include his siblings, Rose and Jessica Cooper continued to spar in the media. The prosecutor believed that she was in the right to proceed, stating, evil can only prevail when good men do nothing. To this, Rose Cipriano replied, I have a little idea about evil that men can do. I dare say perhaps more than Jessica Cooper. Ms. Cooper, you should be ashamed. There was still one way that the Ciprianos could be spared Tucker's trial. If he were to plead either guilty or no contest to the charges and accept a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole for his role in killing his father. 
For weeks leading up to the trial, Greg Cipriano was still desperate to keep the family from having to relive their nightmare in court. He went to see Tucker in jail, hoping to convince him to take responsibility, accept his fate, and plead guilty to first-degree murder. They spoke on the phone frequently. I feel disrespectful saying this, but I feel like fighting for the rest of my life is the only thing I have. The only option I have left to giving up is like hanging myself, Greg. That's what it feels like to me. Well, your dad paid for it with his life. And if you have any hope whatsoever of redemption of your soul, you don't, will do something Greg, don't about come it. At me like that. Whereas Uncle Greg failed to persuade him, younger brother Tanner made a mark. The most biggest moment of your life could be right now, to be deciding that this trial is about forgiveness, taking responsibility, and loving each other. It's more, more meaningful to me that if you, that you could take responsibility for the first time in your life, just as a dad would always want you to. Opened my eyes and broke my heart. I feel like the only way that I'll be able to express my love for the family enough, I'm taking responsibility, you know. I'm sorry for treating you the way I did. You know, I love you. And I'm very, very, very proud of you. Just days later, with the jury ready to sit for testimony, Tucker kept his word to his brother. He entered a plea of no contest, which is not an admission of guilt, but is treated like one for the purposes of sentencing. He would save his family the trial and die in prison. You also understand, should you enter a plea of either no contest or guilty to the charge of first-degree felon murder, that you will go to prison for the rest of your life? Yes, sir. You will not be paroled. Yes, sir. You will die in prison. Yes, sir. Tucker was willing to accept responsibility according to his own version of events. But Mitchell Young was not. I never had the intent to hurt anyone. I didn't go there intending to harm anyone, let alone to kill someone. That's just, that, that, that's a terrible thing. They're saying that I did this to people that I've never met, that I had absolutely nothing against, at a place that I've never been to, with someone that I've been the acquaintance of for about three weeks, a little less than a month. I attempted to intervene, and that's when I was injured, and that's why I was taken to the Bosford Hospital and treated for a dislocated jaw. I went there under the impression that I was helping Tucker Cipriano pick up his personal belongings. You know, I had a pickup truck. That's why he asked me to give him a ride. There were two key pieces of evidence presented at Mitchell Young's trial that pointed to his participation in the attack. Evidence that Tucker's version of what went down was more likely to be accurate. First, there was the DNA testing. Police found two bats inside the house, a Quest and an Easton, both covered in blood. DNA samples from the Quest matched Salvatore and Rose. This bat did not contain Mitchell's DNA, so it could have been the one carried by Tucker. DNA samples from the Easton were sufficient to identify Rose, Salvatore, and Robert as major donors. On this weapon, Mitchell could not be excluded as a DNA donor on the bat's handle. But Tucker could. When police apprehended Mitchell, he had blood on his person and clothing that matched the DNA profiles of Robert, Rose, and Salvatore. A blood spatter forensic expert testified that the blood on Mitchell's pants and boots was consistent with impact spatter, which is caused from an object contacting blood with blunt force. The location of the markings on those pants suggested that Mitchell was standing over the blood source, or rather, standing over the victims. They have in impact spatter on them with that great of a volume, I would say that individual wearing the pants was very close to the blood source when it occurred, and being that it goes up the inseam of the pants, that is indicative of the blood source being below that person. Evidence found on Tucker's clothing was consistent with these conclusions. While there was blood found on Tucker's pants, it was not consistent with impact spatter. The DNA on Tucker's clothing matched to that of Rose and Salvatore, but not Robert. Farmington Hills Police Department Sergeant Richard Wabey had interviewed Mitchell in hospital for three hours. 
He recounted the statements Mitchell had given him about what he claimed had occurred at the house that night. Mitchell advised, he began yelling, what the f are you doing? What the f are you doing? And he stated that Tucker then turned to him and said, if you don't, uh, if you don't get with the program, you don't shut up, you're going to join them. She starts also yelling and she's telling Tucker that I love you. I love you. We'll give you money. Just stop. Just stop. And was yelling at Tucker as Tucker was striking Mr. Cipriano. At that point in time, Mitchell advised that Tucker then handed him the bat and told Mitchell to shut her up. The sergeant found no reason to believe that Mitchell's injuries were caused by Tucker. A doctor who treated Mitchell for his injuries testified that they were not severe enough to have been caused by Tucker attacking him. Indeed, it would seem more likely that they occurred as part of a struggle with Robert. He told you he was afraid of Tucker Cipriano, correct? Correct. He said that he got struck by Tucker Cipriano. He alleges that he was struck by, by Tucker Cipriano. And, and to your, because you did a thorough investigation in this, you know that there is at least some corroboration for that fact because he was treated for a dislocated jaw, correct? I don't know if that was Tucker Cipriano. That could have been Bob Cipriano hitting him. Could have been Rose. The final piece of the puzzle and the most damning evidence presented at Mitchell Young's trial was the testimony of Tucker's good friend, Ian Zinderman. According to Ian, Mitchell, who he knew as Roderick, and Tucker approached him with a plan to loot a house and kill a family. Tucker was in violation of his parole and needed both money and a car to flee to Mexico in order to avoid returning to jail. Ian told the jury about multiple attempts made that night to secure the money they thought was needed. They determined that the Cipriano house was a better choice than any of the neighbors because they assumed that the Ciprianos were wealthier. On the first trip to the house that night, Tucker went through the garage window and returned a short time later with a bank card, his father's. The group went to two gas stations to purchase spice and withdraw cash. But on the second try, the card was flagged for fraud. So they returned to the house. On the second time through, Tucker acquired a gift card, but it was found to only contain a few dollars they needed more. At this point, Tucker and Mitchell began mapping out a plan to kill the family and take more money. They thought they could get close to $3,000, but they needed to decide who was going to kill who. It was decided that um, Tucker was going to go after his two brothers and um, Roderick was going to go after the mom and dad. From what I understand, I understand, yeah, they're supposed to go for the mom and, mom and the dad. And uh, Roderick was supposed to go for the sister. Uh, why did Tucker not want to do that? Tucker loves his sister. Did he mention that? Yeah. Roderick said he was going to kill the mother and father? Yes. And... Tucker said he would kill the brothers. Yes. Now, he has two brothers? Yes. Do they decide an order who was going to get killed first, or do they discuss that? Um, it was discussed that the father was going to kill first. Why? Kill first. Um, he was bigger and more of a threat. Ian Zinderman was offered immunity for any related charges in exchange for his testimony. Mitchell and his defense team were adamant that details of his story kept changing, that he responded with the statement, I do not recall, too many times to be credible. His word was also inherently biased. He was Tucker Cipriano's best friend. But Ian's testimony was impactful and believable. The family would not need to testify. The jury, composed of six men and six women, deliberated for only 90 minutes. Then they pronounced Mitchell Young guilty of all five counts. Uh, count one, first degree premeditated murder, guilty of first degree premeditated murder. Count two, first degree felony murder, guilty of felony murder. Count three, assault with intent to murder. Guilty of assault with intent to murder. 
Count four, assault. Mitchell was 21 years old when he was convicted. Count five, armed robbery. The DNA, in conjunction with Ian Zinderman's testimony, had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he had beaten Robert Cipriano to death. He had also taken part in the attack on Rose, the other parent, just as the two had decided. Tucker Cipriano expressed grief and remorse at his sentencing hearing. He spoke lovingly of his father, the support of his mother, and how he should have been a better brother and a role model to his younger siblings. He was given the only sentence allowable under law, life in prison without the possibility of parole. I'm an irresponsible and may have been an unpleasant older brother, but Tanner, Sal, and Belly, I love you guys with all my heart. Mom, you remember when the teachers had to detach us from you to be able to leave on my first day of first grade, but wouldn't let you go? Well, Mom, I wish I would have never let go. Mitchell Young took his sentencing hearing as an opportunity to air his grievances about the state of his representation at trial. Mitchell insisted that he was not provided a quality defense, and that he was wrongfully convicted. I do have to bring to attention that I'm not satisfied completely with the counsel that you've provided me. I believe there were many things that should have been done that weren't. Yes. This is not your appeal. Everything that you're saying now is your basis for your appeal that the appellate court needs to hear. Yes, Your Honor, I just, I this, need to get this on the record. We're addressing your sentence today. I understand. The, the, also, a lot of this is just things that, I'm sorry. He alleged that his statements during the investigation were edited by Sergeant Richard Wabey. He claimed that witnesses he requested should testify were not called upon. Mitchell also claimed that Ian Zinderman could be impeached as a witness due to his inconsistent statements and admission of faulty recollection. I'm not sure how much of what we've heard today or your actions have to do with uh, a mental disease or um, that you are a very manipulative person. It's probably a little bit of both, in my opinion. Your absolute refusal to acknowledge any of your decisions or your activities in this event, your absolute refusal to take any responsibility is, is really unbelievable to me. In December 2014, Mitchell did eventually make a formal appeal against his conviction. His claims were deemed meritless and his sentence, life in prison without the possibility of parole, was upheld. In the aftermath of the attack, Tanner Cipriano graduated valedictorian of his high school class and in the following years earned a degree from Notre Dame. Salvatore Cipriano continued to make exceptional progress in his recovery, as did his mother Rose. The Farmington Hills community hold regular fundraisers and an annual 5K charitable run to assist with their medical bills and show their support. Despite the association, Salvatore has not been put off the game of baseball. In fact, it is his favorite sport. Tucker is serving out his life sentence. It is unclear if he is in contact with his family. And that was the tragic story of the Cipriano family attack. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.